Hello and welcome everyone to today's Brilliant Minds Bold Questions Virtual Talk. Our series spotlights high-impact research from across the academy, from computer science, population and public health, to economics, and today, molecular microbiology. If you are not familiar with us, CIFAR is a global research organization that convenes extraordinary minds to address the most important questions facing science and humanity. My name is Rachel Parker. I am Senior Director of Research at CIFAR, and it is my distinct pleasure to introduce you to our two speakers for today's talk on how do we get to net zero. First, we have Curtis Berlingett, who is Professor of Chemistry and Chemical and Biological Engineering at the University of British Columbia. Curtis leads an interdisciplinary team seeking ways to discover and scale disruptive clean energy materials. His academic group advances fundamental science and a range of clean energy applications, including CO2 utilization and advanced nuclear fusion. Also joining us is Yogesh Surendranath, or Yogi, who is an associate professor of chemistry at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Research in Yogi's group aims to use renewable electricity to rearrange chemical bonds by controlling inter- facial reactivity at the molecular level. The chemistry of these interfaces is at the heart of nearly all contemporary challenges in renewable energy storage and utilization in a wide variety of technologies. Addressing this challenge is essential for enabling a low carbon energy future. Today's session will last approximately 30 minutes. I will start the session with a question before inviting our speakers to uh, interview one another for about 20 to 25 minutes. And after this, I'll open the floor back up to questions from participants online. If you, as an online audience member, have a question, you can use the Q&A function to submit it. We ask that you not use the chat function to submit questions. Lastly, the session is being recorded and will be available on the CIFAR website next week. Welcome, Curtis and Yogi. So to get us started, we know that CO2 and other heat trapping gases are the main drivers of global warming. To avoid the worst consequences of global warming, we'll need to reach net zero in our carbon footprint in less than 30 years. Obviously, this is no simple task. What is missing from the current research agenda that can aim to address the carbon threat? Thanks, Rachel. And um, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so, so uh, Yogi, so, so chemists worldwide are working to design catalysts that will speed up critical chemical reactions needed to convert renewable resources such as biomass into fuels and chemicals. So Yogi, what is a catalyst and what does it do? Uh, thanks, Curtis. So um, catalysis and catalysis science is really at the heart of many of the challenges we face in decarbonizing the global energy system. Uh, and what, it, what a catalyst really is, is a material, a molecule, it can be many things, but its function is what's critical. It serves the role of neither being produced nor consumed in the, over uh, the overarching chemical reaction, um, but it serves a function of essentially chaperoning the reactants towards products across a low energy, high efficiency pathway. Um, and in doing so, it allows us to carry out chemical reactions much faster than without a catalyst. And um, in the cases of, of energy-driven processes with much lower energy input than we would need if we didn't have a catalyst or if we didn't have the most optimal catalyst. The other thing a catalyst really does that's equally important is it defines what the products are. It, it, it sets whether you turn a reactant into one product or 50,000 products. Uh, and, and how you choose which product you get is critical to how much energy you put in the process, how useful and valuable that product is. Um, and indeed, if you think about the conversion of CO2 into fuels or chemicals, you'd want um, uh, uh, the optimal distribution of those fuel molecules or chemical molecules for a given application, whether it be in the aviation sector or in other areas of our economy, um, but you don't want molecules that would be deleterious to their endpoint use. Uh, and so catalysis plays this essential role in guiding reactions towards one desired product over another, um, uh, thereby minimizing the costs that would otherwise accrue from needing to do energy intensive separations of the products afterwards, um, and in allowing us to access the materials that we would like with the least amount of energy input. 
So let me turn the floor back over to, to Curtis, actually. So, uh, you know, I'm a catalysis science person, but one thing that we've actually learned over the years is that the, the discovery of new materials, new catalysts, new technologies for a lot of these grand decarbonization challenges can take quite a long time. Uh, and many times we don't even know the principles or we don't know the unknown unknowns on that journey towards new technologies. Um, Curtis, I would like to turn the floor over to you and ask, what is your research group doing really to shorten that development timescale? Yeah, and, and, and shortening that development timescale is, is critical for us in terms of solving the CO2 problem because we don't have a lot of time available to come up with, with big solutions. And, and so one of the things our, our group is very motivated by are um, recent advances in robotics and automation, um, big data and machine learning. And what we're doing is we're, we're taking all three of these aspects and we're bringing them into the research laboratory. So that way we can actually make smart robots to make self-driving robots that actually will help us um, make decisions on the experiments that we're making in the lab. And, and our, our mission here is to be able to accelerate the, the time it takes to take a new discovery in the, in the laboratory out in the marketplace by at least tenfold. Um, and one of the challenges that we have with hard tech, with commercializing hard tech and taking things out of the laboratory and into the marketplace is that it tends to take over a decade, often a couple of decades or more. And when we look into the future, we, we want to have some CO2 technologies that are out in the market. Um, within the next decade, not, not two decades from now. And, and so uh, um, what we're trying to do is, is, is be, be able to leverage all of these recent advances in automation to be able to help us do that, to help the researchers in the lab collect more data, to, to collect higher fidelity data, and to also to be able to use algorithms to help process the data that's actually being, being created and, and assimilate that information into discovering new materials, making new devices and advancing those devices um, and, and putting them into practice. Um, you know, when we just, when we look back over the course of history, if we look at fuel cells, for example, it's it's taken three plus decades for fuel cells to start hitting the market, which they're they're really just doing over the last few years. And we, we really think that we can learn from information from that particular sector and, and, and help us accelerate the development of these different technologies. So this is something that that very much motivates us. Curtis, if I can, if I can follow up on that, actually, in, in, in the domain of, of using automation, uh, some of the challenges in deploying green technologies is the challenges, the unforeseen challenges that occur when they get scaled up. Um, talk to me about how automation, if you feel it can, can, can even accelerate and, and perhaps foreshadow those challenges that may occur upon the long long-term deployment or the scale up of, of certain technologies yeah um, so I, I I think automation can help at um, at various stages in the in the development process in the lab it can help us find new materials um, we can then potentially use robotics to take those new materials and to implement them into devices and that process that step of actually taking a brand new material, and putting it into a vice, that, that is a slow step in the lab today. Testing those materials in that device is a slow step for today. Um, and so being able to bring in automation and, and particularly new algorithms that are coming online to help us process data that are coming out of that, we, we're, we're really confident that we can shorten the, 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 the timelines from, from getting from the lab again to, to a commercial product. One of the challenges that, that we have um, as researchers, though, is that it's, it's really difficult to put automation into action. Um, typically, what happens is you, you, you have to buy a robot from a vendor, but most of these robots that are commercially available can only do one specific task. And most of the research that takes place in the university environment requires a number of different tasks, okay? So humans have the uh, incredible dexterity and this ability to pivot on the fly, to do different experiments, to get creative and, and, and shift. And so one of the, the core features of our program is we're actually um, really trying to, to promote this concept of flexible automation, making robots that can change on the fly with you, change with the experiment and evolve with the experiments as your understanding of the experiments um, start to change. And that way you're not having to build a brand new robot for every single step. 
Because if you have to build a brand new robot for every single step, that's going to be slower than the current process today. So it's definitely not a solved problem. And there's uh, several of us in, around the world right now that are really trying to more rapidly um, bring robotics into the laboratory. So that way we can use automation and machine learning to its, its fullest extent. So Yogi, I know, uh, you know you work on something that, that I'm super interested in, and that, that's really the chemistry at the interface, right? That's, that's really where all the action happens. And so can you explain to everyone here how something so seemingly small in scale, really just those, those atoms that exist right at the interface has such a huge impact on the properties of the devices that we're making for um, really making renewable, capturing renewable energy and converting that renewable energy into, into useful forms of energy. Yeah, yeah thanks, Chris. So the, the, you know, um, we, we, I, I've been captivated in that problem of, of interfaces and interfacial reactivity for, for a long time, really the entirety of my independent career. And, and I, I, I got drawn to that by, by sort of a kind of a key point, really, is that, that um, one way I like to think about it is that a lot of the processes we want to drive involve moving things against thermodynamic gradients, um, moving, essentially rolling balls uphill. We want to take energy poor molecules, turn them into energy rich molecules. And, and electricity is a powerful force for actually driving those reactions uphill. And you could ask, so where does electricity carried in sort of macroscopic wires meet molecules and their interconversion reactions? It turns out where that occurs is at interfaces. It occurs in the interfaces of our, our cell phone batteries. It occurs um, in the interfaces of a fuel cell or electrolyzer that's making renewable hydrogen or converting CO2 to a fuel. And, and, and the interesting thing that's so fascinating actually is that despite the critical role that these interface, and the reason that's so critical is because that's where the electrons that come in via charge separation in a circuit meet the molecules that they're going to do reactions on. Um, and so the, the properties of that interface are so critical to defining how catalytic transformations occur and particularly energy relevant transformations occur. What has gratified us and really been interested to think about, and this is why I think you know, CFARS and their support has been, been central to this really, is, is that, that the problems around how we think about interfaces, despite how important they are, the basic understanding of how they function, how they rearrange, how they degrade, how they operate under realistic conditions is still very much in its infancy. We're, we're trying to drive a Ferrari without knowing how the parts are put together, in a sense, in most of the devices that we make. Um, and so you can imagine that when your cell phone battery dies, that becomes a, uh, a more of a phenomenology than something that we can look up in a textbook and be like, ah, that's the reason that the cell phone battery degraded after this amount of cycle number, right? Um, we're still at a place where we, we, we get those pieces of information from the laboratory and we're sort of left scratching our heads wondering why that is. And that's because at an atomistic level, we don't have a robust understanding of how interfaces work. Um, they provide these exotic environments. I mean, one of the things that makes me so so amazed is you know the the interfaces they generate separations of charge that generate some of the largest known electric fields in chemistry. Um, you get enormous electric fields on the order of tens of megavolts per centimeter over the length scale of just a few atoms, and this allows you to literally rip bonds apart. And 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 we've been doing this in electron. We've been ripping some of the strongest bonds apart, the bonds between aluminum and oxygen apart, to make the aluminum that we put in all of our planes. Um, and 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 we still don't even for that process know how that works. Uh, and and so a lot of what my group really studies is how does at an atomistic level how can you use these enormous electric fields that happen at an interface to drive reactions um, against their their native um, propensity to go downhill along a free energy gradient. So so we want to take take energy poor molecules turn them into energy rich molecules. And the way we use it the way we do that is by taking interfacial fields to to literally rearrange those bonds. Uh, and, and we try to unpack those mechanisms and then use that to then design new materials in a systematic way. Is the, is the challenge you're faced with today is that we just don't have the tools available to really dial into that particular region of study? Yeah, so the issue with interfaces is it's a needle in the haystack problem, right? Because you have the bulk of your electrode or your material, and you have the bulk of your solution or your electrolyte, um, and 
even though those are 99.9% of the system, it's that 0.01% right at the interface that defines whether the whole thing works or not. Uh, and and so, so we really have a paucity of tools, if you will. We don't have the microscopes to hone in on what's happening in the interface without the, the sort of clutter and background and fog of all the stuff that's happening in solution or in the solid. Uh, and that's really a core of the challenge. And one of the ways we've really addressed that challenge is not necessarily by making a better microscope but by making better ways to implant something very precisely at the interface and asking from that, how does that lead to specific effects? So in a way, we don't try to measure the needle in the haystack. We try to implant a very shiny needle in the haystack that can serve as a beacon for us to understand that outside of all of the fog. Very cool. So, so speaking of an interfacial problem, you know, um, uh, one of the interfacial problems that, that uh, I, both of us have a lot of interest in is, is converting CO2 into valuable chemicals and fuels. Uh, so talk to me about that, Curtis. What can we convert CO2 into? Um, what are the useful things that we can make it into? And, and how would we go about doing that? Right. Yeah, um, just to calibrate everybody, so uh, um, Yogi and I are, are very much interested in finding ways that we can use clean, renewable electricity to drive these transformations of CO2 into something useful. And ultimately, what the commercial device will look like is, is like a, a water electrolyzer. Um, so a CO2 electrolyzer, think of it just as a, as a is a big box where you've got CO2 going in one side with water and electricity. And then on the other side, you're going to, you're going to have a liquid byproduct and you're going, to, you're going to have some chemical byproduct containing that upgraded carbon. So that CO2 has been upgraded to some carbon species. And, and the beautiful thing about CO2 electrochemistry is that there are a wide range of products that you can make within that electrolyzer by applying really the same amount of electrical energy. The choice of, of product that comes out on the other end all comes back to the identity of that catalyst that you put into the electrolyzer. And this is, gets back to the um, first point that Yogi was making earlier today. The, the, the catalyst plays such a critical role in dictating how that CO2 gets converted into something useful. So what are some of the, the products that could potentially be coming out on the other end? Um, one of the products that we like to make is carbon monoxide. Okay, so no one wants to go to the store to buy carbon monoxide to get it, but you can take that carbon monoxide in a chemical plant and it ends up being a very useful building block. It's a very reactive species and you can convert, you can polymerize that carbon monoxide into useful plastics or other carbon containing materials. Um, you can actually mix it with hydrogen, which is actually a byproduct that comes out of the electrolyzer. So you're effectively making syngas. And so there's an opportunity there to actually just use the, that product that's coming out of the other end and actually do further processing to convert it into fuels that can then be used. Um, there's a range of other products that you make, you know, acetic acid, formic acid, ethylene, and there, there are now thousands of researchers around the world that are uh, all trying to um, really manipulate the catalyst and the engineering of the electrolyzer to be able to make these, these different products. Um, but one of the things that, that we've been really thinking a lot about in our group is just like, if you could actually make all of those carbon products that like all the plastics in the world, um, everything outside of liquid fuels, what, what, you know, what, how much CO2 are you actually going to be fixing? And, um, and so this has actually forced us down this path of really thinking through what type of product should we be converting CO2 into? And, um, and this exercise has actually uh, helped us converge on really focusing on building materials. Um, we, we really are incented to try to figure out how can we take CO2 from the atmosphere and convert it into cement, for example. And why we like cement is that if you're going to take that CO2, convert it into cement, that cement is going to be fixed in place for several decades. And that's one of the other things that we have to take into consideration in the choice of the CO2 products that we're making. Because if we're just going to utilize that, that, that carbon-based product and combust it and return that CO2 back to the atmosphere in a very short time frame, 
We're not necessarily solving the problem. And so this is just another challenge that we have in the CO2 sciences is figuring out what product are we going to make in which we're fixing that carbon for a really long time period. And so building materials seems like one of those um, candidate materials that not a lot of people are looking at right now. Um, people are starting to look at that. And, uh, but we, we see that as a huge opportunity for our field moving forward. Part of the corollary to that is um, uh, CO2 is uh, only at about 400 ppm in the atmosphere, though rising fast. fast. Um, um, but but that doesn't seem very concentrated. H how do we get the CO2 that we would use to convert into all of these valuable products? Right. Um, so we're, we're really relying on different technologies to, to capture that CO2, either from, from air um, or from, from, uh, right, from the flue stack of, of different plants. Um, but ultimately, uh, we need to solve this problem, but really probably by, by taking that CO2 from the atmosphere in some way. And there, there are quite a, different, quite a few different ways of doing that today and um, lots of different technologies that are out there. And uh, I, I really think that what's important for our community is to make sure that our, our CO2 utilization community is really thinking about how that CO2 is captured. So the, the challenge that the CO2 capture folks have is that if they have a technology that captures CO2 readily, that same material that captured the CO2 is not likely going to want to give up that CO2 very easily. And so as a result, there's a, an energy penalty associated with releasing that CO2. So then you can either store it or feed it into your CO2 electrolyzer down the road. And so finding something that captures that CO2 very quickly and at scale, and then is willing to release that CO2 with as little energy as possible is really the grand challenge for us in the CO2 sciences. And something that our CIFAR program is, is, is very motivated to do is actually look at coupling these two communities of CO2 capture and CO2 utilization and bring our different communities and our different technologies together to see if we can do everything in one single unit instead of operating as silos, which really is how we uh, the two communities have been operating over the last few years. So Yogi, I, I mentioned Catalyst. Um, can you mention a little bit more about what the specific properties of Catalyst that you're looking at and how, how specifically you can tune the performance? Yeah, sure. So, so Catalyst Design is, is a kind of a, a grand challenge that, as I think Curtis and I both talked about, pervades a lot of these challenges in green technologies and CO2 um, uh, utilization. Uh, what we really look for in catalysis is something that really will accelerate the reaction as much as possible. That's sort of the, the rate at which the catalyst turns over the reactant into product. Another feature we really look for in a catalyst is something that will form a single product over many products. That's the question of selectivity. Um, the first one is a question of efficiency or, or, or sort of performance of the catalyst. Second one is related to the selectivity of the catalyst. And then there's a very key and often overlooked parameter that's equally important in catalyst science, um, uh, which is the, the durability of your catalyst. How, whether its ability to catalyze that reaction and its ability to do it selectively to a single value-added product, does that remain the same over time? Or after running it 100 or 1,000 hours, does it then degrade and is no longer useful? Of course, you can imagine that a catalyst needs to have a durability on the order of the lifetime of the types of devices we anticipate deploying for CO2 utilization, which we, we, would, be, we would imagine are on the order of many decades, right? So, so in, the, in the same way that the Curtis and I have a shared interest in, in looking at catalysts for CO2 conversion, while the community has made, I, I would say, really amazing progress over the last decade or so in developing new catalysts, new understanding of their mechanisms of action and new ways of controlling their selectivity and efficiency, um, we still haven't yet gotten a good sense for whether those catalysts will have the requisite durability to be able to make it in a device for two decades or three decades, right? Um, uh, and, and in many cases, it's not easy to test that in the laboratory. Um, uh, and oftentimes it's not easy because in a real operating system, your catalyst may be exposed to tiny amounts of foreign materials or poisons or other species that you don't often simulate for in the laboratory. Um, and, and so, so that, that remains just a very much an open challenge for catalysis science, but critical to the, to the, to the deployment of these technologies. 
So a follow-up question on, on that, if, if I could just interject here as well. Um, I'm, I'm curious what the biggest barriers are for the adoption of green technology from a commercialization standpoint. You know, Yogi just touched on the, on the big one, and that is proving out a technology can survive in the real world for several years, if not a decade or more. And we simply don't have a lot of tools available to us that allow us to do the accelerated testing that is reliable enough that gives the people that are going to go out and commercialize these technologies the comfort to both invest in it and to be able to introduce those, those products into their plant. Um, so durability, I would say, is probably the, the, it is the one step that takes the longest to prove out because ultimately you have to run the experiment before a lot of people will invest and, and use it. And so coming up with new ways to, um, to really try to understand how we can get information on how a system will behave years into the future is it needs to become a more important um, area of, of science and, and engineering for the community. I would say that the other limitation until the last couple of years, of course, is, is really the capital available to be able to go out and pursue many of these technologies. Um, there was a lot of money that uh, got injected into clean tech in the early part of the century. And after 2008, um, a lot of that capital disappeared and clean tech became a very bad word in the investment world. Um, what's happening today is now people are a lot more sensitive to global warming. They're, they're impacted directly by global warming. And now everybody's realizing that we really do need to invest in this. And so I'm, I'm actually really excited to see how much capital is coming back into looking at, at clean energy technologies and carbon capture, carbon utilization. These are some, some very hot areas for investment right now. And this is really how you drive change. So I'm, I'm really excited to, to, see the, the interest that, and support that we're getting from beyond the science community that we actually weren't getting even a couple of years ago. That seems to me like the perfect ending point uh, for today. Let's end on a note of optimism for the future um, and, and hope that uh, we've captured people's um, uh, imagination and interest in, in the subject. And uh, we wish you all the all the best. And uh, thank you so much, Yogi and Curtis, for taking your time to talk with us today. We look forward to watching your program in future. And thanks, everybody, for watching it from home. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to CPAR.